Lord Jesus, we just come before you this evening, Lord, and we're just so thankful that we can be, we can be in your house. We're thankful, Lord, that you are the anchor for our soul. We're thankful for your word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We're thankful that we're part of your family, Lord. We're thankful that we're in a Bible believing in a Bible based church. We thank you, Lord, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And we commit our night to you, that you would guide us, that you would encourage us, Lord, but you would also instruct us in the ways of your word. I pray, Lord God, that each and every heart would be open to receive from your word and that we would leave here, Lord, as you would intend. And we commit also our fellowship, God, that it would be Christ centered and it would be so God focused. And we just love that we get to be part of what you're doing in this earth even though the world today is just going crazy at least we know that we can have a stable foundation in your word in your house and together as part of your family and we ask that you bless us tonight lord in jesus name amen amen, amen. so obviously the beatitudes is um, part of the sermon in the mount and the sermon on the mount is found <coughs> in matthew chapter 5. It's, it's the long, longest discourse in the Bible. Um, and interestingly, one of the commentators when I was reading had noticed, noted the difference. If you think of the Old Testament where Moses went up the mountain alone to go and see God so that God gave him the Ten Commandments written on the, the stone, Nobody else was allowed to go up the mountain. It was only Moses. God only commanded Moses to come up. <coughs> and here when we actually see Jesus in the Sermon of the Mount, he's now on the mountain. He's sitting down and the multitudes are there. And I just think, wow, what a beautiful picture. The Old Testament God, it was Moses and it was just him. But he knew that Jesus was going to come and with Jesus was going to be a personal relationship. And with Jesus, here was God really coming to the people. So I just love reading things like that because it just really encourages me and it just makes me so in awe of who God is. Um, you know, John MacArthur um, basically, has, basically says that God's law is really, wait a minute, I've lost my, my wee bit here. This is me trying to get used to, this is me trying to get used to my iPad, so you'll need to be with me. Um, so basically, um, God always knew that people could not keep his perfect law. Certainly the Jews tried, and you only need to read the book of Leviticus um, to see the requirements made by God to justify his wrath against sin. If you've ever read the book of Leviticus, more than once, I salute you because <laughs> any time I read it, I'm like, oh, because see the amount of sacrifices that had to be made for to atone for the people's sin, whether you had a pimple, whether you had a hair coming out your chin, anything that was deemed unclean by God's holy standards had to be atoned for. And when you read it, I would be like, gosh, they priests have never got a minute off. I mean, when did they ever get a break? Because people are always coming because they're, we're so sinful. We're just constantly sinning. Um, and, if, and in Matthew 5, verse 17, Jesus said that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And in Matthew, verses 1 and 2, Jesus says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. <coughs> Then he opened his mouth and taught them. So here's Jesus, he's sitting on the mountain, the multitudes are there, and he's opened his mouth to teach whoever's there. Um, but who is the them, you know, to teach them? Who is the them? Who is the multitudes? Well, we can gather it's his disciples. We know there'll be Pharisees there who are religious people. There's the Sadducees who are equally religious. They're sinners. Um, we also know from other stories in the Bible that Jesus' ministry always had Pharisees there, you know, in the presence. They had lawyers, there was scoffers, there was the poor, there was women, and there was people who were lame and who were, and who were sick. Um, and we know that Jesus also preached in the synagogues. So the Jews would have known what Jesus was about because he went around the synagogues preaching, but here he is now his first sermon preaching to the multitudes um and he, and i just think oh, 
what what an amazing what an amazing picture of Jesus his first ever sermon <laughs> and John MacArthur says the sermon is a masterful exposition of the law and a potent assault on Pharisaic legalism closing with a call to true faith and salvation Christ expounded the full meaning of the law showing that its demands were humanly impossible so imagine this is Jesus's first ever sermon each week we sit under a pastor and are blessed to have such a great teacher of God's word to minister to us. Imagine how incredible that must have been to sit and hear Jesus preach. Sometimes I think when you're reading God's word, it's good to capture these things because it, may, it captures your heart in an awe of God and who Jesus is and what it must have been like to you know, actually sit and hear him preaching. If you think of what it's like for us on a Sunday where <coughs> we are encouraged, we're exhorted, we're challenged, we're instructed. And for the most part, most of us love God's word and how thankful we are for it. Imagine what it would have been like hearing Jesus preach. God in the universe. Um, so the Beatitudes, so the first Beatitude and the one that we're going to look at tonight is Matthew 5 verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Don't worry, once I'll, I'll send out all the scriptures that I'm using as well, you know, in a text, just so that you know all the ones that I've used um, in the study. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the first thing that Jesus said. So what does it mean to be blessed? It means to be happy, fortunate and blissful. The closest word in the Greek to being blessed is happy. So, honest question, do you want to be happy? It's evident that God wants you to be happy. Do you actually know that God wants you to be happy? That's quite a thought as well, to imagine that God actually wants you to be happy. But he does. Otherwise, this is the first one. Why would he say it if he didn't want you to be happy? God says the poor in spirit are blessed. God says the poor in spirit are happy. In Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Meaning God's ways to happiness is not what we think it should be. God's thoughts are completely different to yours. His ways are completely different to yours. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, what is it that you associate happiness with? What do you think makes you happy? Is it getting what you want? Is it having money? Is it having nice things? A good job, relationship, having kids, being in control, feeling a bit superior? Whatever it is, some people, it's, you have to know, well, what is it that I believe or I associate with happiness? Um, if I could just have, if they would only, we could all say that, couldn't we? Like, we at all sphere of life, and it's all the if, if, if. There's always an if, there's always a but to something that if that happened, we would be happy. And John MacArthur says, the worldly idea is that happiness is found in riches, merriment, abundance, leisure, and such things. So I would challenge us all and say that we've been sitting under God's word. I would say most of us long enough to know that God's blessings and being blessed has nothing to do with anything external. We should know that. Mm. We hear that week in and week out. Now, we might not want to accept it. We might want to just put that in our pocket somewhere, but you can't deny the truth. Mm. And if you know, and if you don't know that, my prayer tonight is that after tonight, that you absolutely certainly will. You know, I know many people who would bet their life that if certain circumstances changed or things in their life were met, that they would be convinced they would be happy. Convinced they would be happy. Have you ever desired something only to finally receive it and still not be happy? You better believe you have. Or if you haven't, then I don't know that you're being completely honest. That is because as the saying goes, happiness is an inside job and it's something that God bestows on the poor in spirit. And that's the correlation. To be happy, you need to be poor in spirit. So 
what also makes you not happy? You have to you have to ask yourself that question. What makes me not happy? Inside, you might believe that somehow you're self-sufficient in determining your happiness, that it's all about what you determine, what you can do, that's pride. Um, you might also believe that there's something inside that makes you worthy of happiness, deserving of happiness. Who's all had that? This is all worldly. This is this is not God's ways. This is not God's thoughts. This is our sinful nature that actually tells us this. You might see yourself as a victim of circumstances. You can be jealous of other people, other women. You can believe that a man can fill a need that's in your soul. You can also believe that if you behave a certain way, I'm not saying that circumstances can't have an effect on us because they can. But my point is, if you are looking to externals to be happy, you'll never ever experience the fullness of God's gift of being blessed. So I think we have to ask ourselves these questions. What do I believe makes me happy and what doesn't make me happy? Because they're both, they're both cut for the same cloth. Mm -hmm. you'll, both get, you'll get the same answers for both questions. And if you're really honest and you look at it and you measure it up against what God says, you're looking in the wrong places looking in the wrong places so the big question is do you want to be happy that is a big question do you want to be happy i want to be happy and here's the thing god wants us to be happy so why would we not want to be happy because god wants us to be happy now some of us might have been brought up with a doom and gloom you know like you'd never think that god would want you to be happy and how the world hijacks happiness and what it means to be happy but this is God's word. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So that tells me that God wants us to be happy. Um, we need to then understand what is it? What does it mean to be poor in spirit? You know, Calvin says, he only who is reduced to nothing in himself and relies on the mercy of God is poor in spirit. You're reduced to nothing in yourself. <coughs> It's like I said earlier, I deserve to be happy. Really? Well, that's the opposite of what God says. You have to be reduced to nothing in yourself and rely on the mercy of God to be poor in spirit. Remember, the reason for Jesus' sermon is to explain that he has come to fulfil the law. He's telling everybody there that there is nothing that anybody can do of himself to fulfil God's law perfectly. That's the gospel. You can imagine the religious people there, the, the pious people there, people who compare their lives and sin to others, telling themselves, I'm not that bad, or not as bad as them, who believe that they are good enough to go to heaven, that they can ex achieve acceptance by God through works. I mean, I know what that's like, you know, being brought up Catholic, you think you can work your way into God's favour, that somehow you're a good person. I'm not really a bad person, I mean, I'm not that bad. And we measure ourselves and we compartmentalise ourselves and we compartmentalise um, our sin. But what Jesus is actually talking about here, he's talking about the doctrine of depravity. You'll have heard that spoken about at different times. Um, but what that means is if we, in James, is in the book of James 2.10, it says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. So it's like the rich young ruler, Jesus, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, well, if you've done A, B, C, D, I've done all that. Jesus, I've done that and I've done that. And Jesus says, well, go and sell all and give it to the poor. And he walks away. See, <coughs> see if we sin in one thing, we might keep a lot of the commandments that like we've not murdered anybody. We've not, you know, we're, like, we're honourable to our parents, that like we're not stealing, whatever it may be. But see if we tell lies, a wee white lie. Well, I'm sorry, Jesus says that that's the full brunt of the law. That means you're like a murderer, you're like everything else. That is, you're accountable for it all. So, um, so Jesus came to fulfil the law because God knew that no person could live to the standard of his holiness, his justice and his ways. And again, if you want to read the book of Leviticus, but then, because I'm telling you, you will see why, because it is, it is just dire when you see you've got the sin, 
you know, what people had to do to get atonement for their sin. There was nothing anybody could do that was completely at right standing with God, and God knew that. Um, we were born in sin, and we have nothing good in us. In Mark 10, 18, Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. None of us are good. Total depravity means that human nature is thoroughly corrupt and sinful as a result of the fall. You know, I remember reading this and I thought, this is a great example. See if you're a driver and you're on the motorway and the law states that you shouldn't go over 70 miles an hour. Well, that's a law that's got absolutely none of your business. You need to drive within 70 miles an hour and sometimes you might go over it. But see the law that's set by the government, then you're subject to that law because if you're caught going over 70 miles an hour, you're going to get three points of license and probably a fine. That's like the law of sin. It's none of your business. It's there, it's a law. You've got no control over it. You've got nothing, you try to keep it because you want to go for the 70 mile an hour. You're trying to no tell lies. You're trying to be honorable. You're trying not to murder people in your thoughts or whatever's mm -hmm. going on. You're trying your best all the time to fulfill the law, but it's set and you can't change the law. And that's what Jesus is saying. You can't change it. There's nothing in you that can change, that can change the law. John MacArthur says that we're not all equally depraved as there are levels of wickedness and we see that in the world today. You see these leaders and you see these like um, presidents of countries and I'm thinking oh my gosh you just the level of wickedness and they're evil but we are still depraved and I love what R.C. Sproul says he says potentially we have we are all Hitler now, I know you don't want to think that that's who you are, but see when you really know your de depth of your own personal depravity, he says that the only reason we're not is because of God's restraint in their life. There's another reason of how amazing God is. That's the only reason you're not like Hitler. It's because of God's restraint in your life. I find that really humbling because we're so apt to judge and say, I wouldn't be as bad as them. Would you not? Well, see, without God, Listen, you don't know what you would be. Um, we are thoroughly corrupt. There is nothing good in us at all. Therefore, to be poor in spirit is to know that you are nothing, that you have nothing, you deserve nothing, and can have nothing of worth to plead to God with and to find his acceptance and favour. I used to go to um, confession and sit with the priest and be like, I'm a terrible person. But it was always about me. It was never about my sin towards God. It was always about me. It was never about God. And that, you know, that's still about me and it's still about us and our sin. But it's really, we have nothing, nothing at all um, to offer God. Poor in spirit is not, as I say, feeling bad about your behaviour. Although we'll cover that in the next Beatitude about what it means to mourn over our sin, what it means to truly mourn. Um, in the context of the Beatitudes and what Jesus is teaching us. Poor in spirit is not having you at the centre and you somehow believing that you can fix a problem. You can't fix your sin problem. You can't behave your way into being a better person for God to love. Now, sanctification causes us to want to become a better person, to treat people better and to you know, be a servant for God. It's not that you just laugh, well, I'm sorry, I was really horrible. You know, it's nothing to do with me. That's not what I'm saying. This is about in your relationship to God. Um, and it's not about behaving sorrowful because you think you're going to lose something. Oh, I'm really sorry about that, but it's not genuine. It's about what you're going to lose. It's not about your sin to God. Um, poor in spirit is acknowledging our spiritual bankruptcy spiritual poverty before God. Poor in spirit is the opposite of self-sufficiency that tells us we are good and can earn favour with God. That's what John MacArthur says. One of the great stories, and it's a parable in the Bible, and um, I'll read it out, and as I say, I'll send you the stu um, these scriptures. It's in Luke 18, verses 10 to 14, and I think it sums it up what it's like to be poor in spirit. And Jesus is telling this story and he says, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. 
I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all that I of all that I possess. And the other picture is, and the tax collector standing <coughs> afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For anyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The scripture tells us that he was justified in the sight of God, as he had recognised his sinfulness and his need for God's mercy. He was poor in spirit. He was not justified in his sin, i.e. have mercy in me, God, but they're the problem. He took complete responsibility for his own sin, blaming no one but himself. That is poor in spirit. The doctrine of predestination is laid out in Romans 8, verses 29 to 30. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, who he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. That's the justification that that, that parable's teaching. God justified him. It's God that justified him. We must have a broken and a contrite heart. Salvation is of the Lord, and it is the Lord who opens a person's eyes to his sin and need for a saviour. The Apostle Paul, many of us know the story. He was on the Damascus Road. I mean, he was killing Christians. He's on a mission. He believes he's really um, going for God and doing God a favour. And he would have felt he was a he was a part of the Sanhedrin. So he was very religious. He believed that works would have got him in favour with God. That he would have could have acted his way and behaved his way into God's favour. And we know that um, as he was walking along the Damascus Road, a blinding light came, and it was Jesus. And Paul was Paul was blinded. Um, God had to get his attention because he was on a mission, he was killing people and everything. Um, for Paul to know that it was pure, pure in spirit, that's what it took for the Apostle Paul. He had to be totally blinded, totally disabled, totally needed to be dependent on someone else, that there was nothing that he could have done of himself. He couldn't have then marched away with blind. He was totally like immobilised like a child and had to take instruction for God. And it was in that that Paul knew and experienced salvation. When the scales fell from his eyes, he knew that he was a sinner. He knew that God had been so merciful to him, that he was deserving of death, that he should have been killed for what he was doing, that he was, you know, far, far away from Mm -hmm. Christ. He was persecuting Christ. And Jesus was saying, what are you doing? and Paul described himself in the scriptures as being the worst of all sinners. You know, that moment of salvation, and I know it's different for different people, but, and I know my own, my own when I get saved, and it's like when you know through God's grace, opening your eyes, you can see, and Mark spoke about it on Sunday, you've rejected Christ, you've mocked Christ, all the things that you've done, um, and you believed somehow that you were better than what you are that you were good somehow, not that bad. And then you experience God's mercy and forgiveness. That's when you're poor in spirit. That's mm-hmm. been poor in spirit, that you are like a defenseless baby who can do nothing and God's grace comes down and just bestows you with mercy, grace, and you experience his forgiveness. That's been poor in spirit. That's what we need to be like. That's how we experience salvation. And the truth is we're all deserving of death. We're all deserving of spending eternity in hell for our sins against God. You know, it was sobering on Sunday. Um, I was listening to the message earlier today and just picturing Jesus, that 500 people garrison, you know, and um, Pilate and how much a coward he was. And you're thinking, were you compromising your own life and trying to save your own skin and... You know, we're all pilot. I said on Sunday, I just wanted to crawl back under the stone, um, you know, for which I came, because we are pilot. We've ridiculed Jesus. 
I used to be like that. Jesus, the name, I would let head down. Ridicule Jesus. I mocked Jesus. I reduced him to a small God. The God in my understanding, how I perceive God. <coughs> just a man. And to think that we're not that. Behold the man. We are that man. Means that you're not poor in spirit. Because God's ways are not our ways. So being poor in spirit is the foundation beatitude. It is the chief cornerstone because it's Jesus and it's salvation. It is the anchor for your soul. Um, it really is, you know, like an alcoholic synonymous. The, your, the first step is that you acknowledge that your um, life is unmanageable. You know, that you, gosh, I can't remember it now. That's a good sign, isn't it? Um, can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't drink alcohol or something and your life would become unmanageable that's your step one that's your first step and any time you would be going through the steps of like back to step one like <clears throat> my life is unmanageable you know you have to get to that this is like the beatitude I'm poor in spirit mm -hmm. I'm poor in spirit I'm a nobody I'm a nothing compared to God it's not about each other here this is about you and it's about you and God that is your foundation that beatitude like I am poor in spirit it's the one upon which all the other nine and the whole sermon rests on you can't have the rest without this one this is the one that you need to get um, so you as I say you can't move on without it um, scripture says that we were dead in our transgressions dead and in Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 2, remember Mark has actually taught this, that it says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And that's the Apostle Paul talking. Before we get saved, we were dead in our transgressions. And if you're dead, you can't raise yourself to life. Let's face it, you know what I mean? Only God can give you a new life. Only God can create life. And God can give you a new life. Um, in our daily lives, we should live as a poor in spirit. We should have gratitude at God and his great mercy, that he would pour out his love and forgiveness in us. Thomas Watson says, till we are poor in spirit, Christ is never precious. And that's so true. It's never precious. Till we are poor in spirit, we are not capable of receiving grace. God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. I would never have thought I was a prideful person before I get saved, but... I knew people who knew me and used to think, I Catholics, you think she's all right, they Catholics, you know, and can work her way up. And I never <coughs> knew that I was like that. And usually when you're like that, you don't know that you're like that. You don't know you're prideful until God gives you grace to see that you're actually prideful mm. and you need to be humble. Um, so if it's Jesus that's made us alive, why do we believe that we need to use something or seek someone to help us when we're in pain. Think about that. So Jesus made us, made us alive when we're dead in our transgressions. That if you think in your life when you're maybe in pain or you're suffering or you're upset about something, where is it you go to get fixed? Because if it's Jesus that makes you alive, then Jesus is the answer. No people, no stuff, it's Jesus. Because he's got the power to make you alive. He's got the power to um, help us. So we should really be going to him continually, seeking <coughs> when we are in pain, when we do feel rejected, when we are rejected, when we've got issues, we should be taking that to God. And we should also be going to him in good times so that we're giving thanks. So it's in all <coughs> seasons that we're giving thanks to God. It's a real poor in spirit, attitude why me well why know you why not some people in life go through life i always remember mark telling the story about um a couple of knew i think he did a job for a man years ago and they had a son with um i think a learning disability or physical disabilities i can't remember and the man had said to mark he says you know my wife had said to me why us 
why us, John? And he says, well, why not us? Would you wish this in somebody else? It's just a, you know, it's a thankfulness, no matter the circumstances that's in our mm-hmm. life. Um, and this is what Mark said, or to this effect, when I was talking to him about it, he says, if we know how depraved we are, and what God has and continually does for us, we will live our life as a broken vessel. A faithful servant of the Lord, whose whole life is one lived with a broken human spirit. When we have that broken human spirit, that then begins the beginning of all servanthood. No believer can truly live a Christ-like life with a human spirit that is not first broken. Yet we fear that, don't we? We fear that, but yet it's in that brokenness, it's in that pure in spirit that that's where happiness, that's where life it begins and salvation. Um, so what should you do? Well, this is what John MacArthur says, and I think he's a good, a better source than me is to help you with what it is that you need to do. He says that you need to start by comparing yourself to God. <laughs> And you could throw in here comparing yourself to the law of God, which is merely an expression of his nature. The perfections of his law are merely expressions of who he is. Compare yourself to God in Christ, recognising that how far short you fall. Then just cry, which I love. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And that just, that's the prayer. So the guy in the parable, Lord, beat me to be merciful to me, a sinner. So how do you know if you've really come to poverty of spirit? John MacArthur also says, you know it when your pride is gone, your self-righteousness is gone, when as Psalm 131 says, your soul is like a weaned child, you've been weaned off yourself, hello, Ooh. And you begin to look at Jesus Christ with love and wonder. And all of a sudden you will have a hunger for the truth and a hunger for scripture. And you'll take it at face value and you'll believe it. I love that. That's so true, isn't it? That that's how the regenerated heart, the changed heart, the born again spirit, you just see things differently. R.C. Sproul, when people are asking about their salvation, they will say to people, Do you have an affection and love for Christ? Do you love Jesus? And they'll say, some people might say, well, no. Or other people say, yeah, I love Jesus. He says, well, you can't love Jesus without God changing you in your heart to love Jesus. That's a good measuring stick because see, before I get saved, I can tell you Jesus was never on my lips at all. And I certainly didn't have any love for him. I love him the day. And that's just what he's saying, it changes you, it changes who you are. So what are the poor in spirit promised? What do we inherit when we live (coughs) as a poor in spirit? The scripture says the kingdom of heaven. Yes, our eternity is secured and we can look forward to the promise of spending eternity in heaven with God. Where it says in Revelation 21, 4, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. What a glorious place that will be in heaven. And also in Ephesians 3, 1, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. How fortunate are we? If you're in Christ, you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That's what we have if we're poor in spirit, if we know Christ. And also, it's not just an eternity thinking in heaven, although we should be eternally minded, because that helps elevate and lift you when you're going through difficulties, because you know this world is not our home, heaven is our home, and it gives us an eternal perspective instead of the immediate. But this is about us living the kingdom of God every day. This is about us every day living in that kingdom. And it also says, and as we're promised in Galatians 5 and 22, 23, we're promised the fruit of the Spirit. And it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 
gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. So that's a law, it's fulfilled, there's no law in that. And Thomas Watson says, how many have perished by being their own saviour? We've all probably tried to be our own saviour, it doesn't work. Oh, that this might drive the proud sinner out of himself, and no man can come out till Christ first comes in. So we have every spiritual blessing in us to live a life that's poor in spirit. So it's a daily outworking in our lives, being poor in spirit. It is a heart attitude, it's a be attitude, it is a heart attitude. It is God's ways that are not our ways. It's a complete topsy-turny, topsy-turvy turn in how the world sees happiness and how God wants us to be happy and if we'll actually to have true happiness. So to close, our prayer should be like the man in Luke 18, have mercy on me a sinner Lord. And like David prayed in Psalm 51, against you and you alone have I sinned. That should be our daily heart's cry, that we remain poor in spirit and knowing what we have been saved from, will fill our hearts, mind and souls with happiness, just as God wants to bless us with. That is true happiness. And if we truly want to be happy, that's how we need to live. Mm -hmm. And I just seen a post that Mark posted actually before we come in and I just think this also sums it up. I'll just read it out what it says. To know our own wretchedness and know we have nothing in us of ourselves that's good except for his gracious mercy. It's not to take offences when they come personally, but simply to pray in gratitude, I know, but that for the grace of God we are and would be no better and maybe even worse. We could be like Hitler, let's face it. To hate your brother is to have no love of the Father in us. Why would we be anything other than broken hearted for that person who inflicts hate? If we truly remembered our own broken heartedness, would we be anything other than broken hearted for them and have only a desire to bid them to come and see whom Christ is? Is that not beautiful? Mm. That's what it is to that. That's pure. That's the poor in spirit. And that's how we should be living. Mm. So before I pray to close, I just want to ask if anybody's got any questions. Listen, this is the first one. We're all learning together. It's, you know, this is the first one. So we might end up tweaking some stuff. I don't know. But um, so I just want to put it there. If Andy wants to ask a question, I'll, I'll try and see if I can answer it. So you don't have to. I've explained it quite well then. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Donna has for you um, a little handout to take away, um, and it's just the scripture. There's a meditation on it, a beautiful poem. Um, I'll just read it out actually, so that when you get it, I think it's beautiful. And it's John Stow, and basically it says, "Nothing in my hand I bring." Simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me saviour or I die. And I remember when I read that, I was in tears. It's just something to just think on and look at and pray about. Um, and some of the questions that I asked tonight are going to be in this for you to go away, where you can ask yourselves, what do you associate happiness with? What makes you not happy? And what should you do? How should you live now that you understand what it means to be happy by being poor in spirit? And also to write out a prayer to God, asking him to help you to live a life that's poor in spirit and then service to him. So that's your homework, if you like. Um, so we'll just close in prayer and then we can get a nice coffee and chat things through together as women. Oh, Lord Jesus. <coughs> Lord, I just ask you to forgive me for the times, Lord, where I'm not poor in spirit, where my pride rises up and where I'm looking for justification for hurts caused to me, God, and not recognising my own sinfulness where I've caused hurt to others. I pray, Lord, that I recognise any sin that I have, first and foremost, 
is sinning against you and you alone, God. It's your law that I'm breaching. And I just thank you, Lord, that your word is, oh, it's just so amazing, God, that it just is that light and that lamp that we need. It's the food, the spiritual food that we need, Lord. I pray that every woman here tonight, Lord, would live a life poor in spirit, that they would know deep and true everlasting happiness that comes from living your ways, that comes from knowing your word and being free in Christ. I pray, Lord, for anyone who may not know yourself as their Lord and Saviour, that they would truly, that you, Lord, and only you can do this, Lord, is open the eyes of their heart and give them a revelation of their own sinfulness, their own poverty, their spiritual bankruptcy, and that they would come and trust in you, Lord Jesus. And finally, Lord, we're just so grateful that we do have your word, that we're not persecuted, that we can be in church when many churches across the world and believers are facing such persecution. And we just ask that we continue to grow as women, that we continue to grow in our church. I ask that you continue to lead our pastor and our elders, Lord, as they're taking us through membership, as we continue learning through the Gospel of John and every great thing that you're showing us in your word, Lord, that we would become lesser and lesser and lesser and that you, Lord, would become greater and greater and greater. And we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.